Two things are trending right now. The paying rent, it's definitely burning hole in your pocket. So the rising rentals in the state's capital, Bengaluru. Moving dominance in a seller's market and the rent only seems to be rising. For the past few weeks, me and my friend have been trying to rent a place in Bangalore. And my goodness, it's almost impossible to find a good place to rent in Bangalore because even if we did find one, it would disappear in a matter of seconds because somebody else got to it before we could. And if somehow, luckily, we managed to have a discussion with the owner, meet them and hope to convince them to actually rent their place to us, we'd soon find out that the owner didn't want to rent to us in the first place because they didn't like the color of the shirt I was wearing. And that's not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that rents in Bangalore are absurd right now. It's insane. And I've been thinking about this a lot. Like why are rents in Bangalore, in so many parts, increasing so quickly and what can people do to just find a good place in Bangalore? Well, to answer these questions and to understand how the real estate market in Bangalore got so bad, we have to go back in time. Real estate boom in Bangalore began in the early 1990s. Uh, the then Chief Ministers of Bangalore, Mr. Veerappa Moili and Mr. H.D. Devagauda, uh, both realized that they had an opportunity to turn Bangalore into the IT hub of this country. And so they decided to draft policies to realize this vision and also invited companies and tech leaders to set up shop in Bangalore. Meanwhile, uh, real estate developers from Bombay and Delhi realized they had an opportunity to build large apartment complexes for people looking at the next big investment opportunity in this city. Massive plots with colonial bungalows were converted into large multi-story apartment blocks and areas in central and south Bangalore saw rapid development. Uh, we're talking about places like JP Nagar, Jayanagar, Indranagar and Kormangla. And the government didn't sit idly either. They invested heavily in decongesting these parts of the city. They built ring roads, flyovers and truck terminals to bring Bengaluru into the limelight. And then it happened. In the mid-1990s, the tech sector just exploded and Bengaluru became the IT hub as we know it today. Take the case of Electronic City. In 1978, the then chairman of Karnataka Electronic dreamed of setting up a tech park for electronic companies. But by the early 1990s, the tech park for electronic companies, Electronic City, had become an IT hub as companies like Infosys, Wipro, Putney and Siemens began setting up campuses in and around this area. And you saw a huge influx of people coming in from all parts of the country to Bangalore. In the north, east, a new Bengaluru was being carved out in Whitefield. ITPL set up the first tech park in the city and soon developers were building malls, apartment complexes and schools in what was once a sleepy settlement for Europeans. You'll see the same pattern emerge in Martahalli as well. Tech parks open up, people move in and developers start building apartment complexes to accommodate this demand. And herein lies the problem. Let's suppose one of these IT workers working in a tech park takes up close to 100 square feet of commercial space on average. Now that same worker will require 10x more residential space, that is 1000 square feet of residential space to accommodate themselves and their families. Which means that every square feet of commercial space will require 10 square feet of residential space to accommodate one IT worker. And when you add it across millions of IT workers moving into Bangalore every year, the scale of the problem starts becoming more obvious. In 2010, there were nearly 10 lakh IT employees working in Bengaluru. But in 2020, that number likely went up to 20 lakhs based on the latest estimates that I could find. And I'm only counting people directly employed in the IT sector here. Because the reality is that every IT job also creates three indirect jobs in the city and Bengaluru has to accommodate them, especially if they're moving in from other cities. Granted, they may not take as much space, but still, you start beginning to see how Bengaluru can get incredibly crowded in a short period of time just because of the amount of people moving into the city. And if you don't believe me, just look at these charts. 
this shows how the landscape of Bengaluru has changed over the years. And if you look at the most recent chart, uh, you'll see that most parts of central Bengaluru is covered with built up areas. All you have left is the outer parts of the city where you could potentially settle the next wave of IT workers. And considering this chart is slightly dated, maybe things have gotten worse here also. Uh, my point is, there's simply no land stock available. Everything is taken. And since developers are increasingly trying to spin off properties in dense urban areas, you can see why prices are skyrocketing. Here's data compiled by Cushman and Wakefield. Uh, let's ignore the high-end segment. Uh, instead, just look at the mid-segment. In central Bengaluru, uh, prices have already breached the 75,000 to 1 lakh mark. It's completely unsustainable. And only as you move outwards do prices start becoming slightly more reasonable. And I've experienced this firsthand in the south where I live, that is JP Nagar, uh, owners in gated societies are already quoting rents of about 35k to 45k for 2 BHKs and 50 to 75k for 3 BHKs. I can only imagine how bad the situation is in central parts of the city. And the problem for people living in these parts of the city is that rental prices are unlikely to come down in the future. At least in places like Whitefield, even though there's been a significant influx of IT workers in the past two decades, rental prices could moderate if developers start spinning off new properties because there's still some land stock available. But what about places in central Bangalore? I told you, the land stock has dried up. And so even if developers somehow started building higher and higher apartment complexes, it's unlikely that the prices will moderate to a reasonable level. Which means the situation in places like Kormangla, Indranagar and MG Road becomes almost unsustainable. Now, people working in these parts have a very, very difficult decision to make. They could continue living in the city uh, pay the high rents and somehow make it work or they could move away and travel into the city. And I know that the second option makes more financial sense even with the added fuel costs. But what about time? Uh, time wasted in traffic, time that you could have spent with your loved ones and time that you could have taken out for yourself. When you factor in all of this, is it worth the money? Uh, that's a tough question to answer. And even if you somehow decided to move away from central Bengaluru to say south Bengaluru, uh, that's where I live, JP Nagar, then you'll only be pushing the rent prices higher in these parts. Uh, there's no escaping this problem. In fact, as schools open up and more IT workers start returning, uh, away, moving away from work from home, uh, things are only likely to get worse. And so far, I've only talked about high income individuals. Low and middle income individuals have already left the city because they've realized rental prices are simply unsustainable. They've given up because it's a lost cause. The fact of the matter is I am privileged. People like me are privileged. And you could even argue that one of the reasons rental prices are going up is because there's always new demand coming in from people like me, tech folks who've managed to negotiate ever high salaries because of the boom the IT boom that's transpired in the last two decades, including the startup boom that's transpired in the past few years. And so we can still afford to live in these beautiful cities because we have the spending power. Many people can't even make that choice and it's sad. Which brings me to my final point. What can you possibly do if you're trying to rent a home in Bengaluru? Well, most people I've met have suggested that I start negotiating better but the truth is that most owners that I've met already have 20 people in their contact list wanting to buy the property any second. So I don't think negotiations will always work. What will work, however, is it's best if you have a rent agreement in place. Uh, outlining things like the maximum rental hikes that can take place each year, notice periods, etc. And I know that most people don't think rental agreements also work, but the thing is it's always better to have one in place than not have one in place. Also, if you're planning to take up a job in Bengaluru, I think you should most definitely consider the impact of rent on your total income. Uh, do a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, see if paying the higher rent actually makes sense, even if you somehow manage to negotiate a better salary here. Because in most cases, you'll probably see that it makes sense to stay somewhere else. And yeah, outside of that, 
I don't think there's a lot you can do about the situation. Hopefully, as India progresses, you'll start seeing more Bengalurus crop up in other parts of the country, other parts of Karnataka, so that the load on this beautiful city isn't as high. And yeah, that's it from me, I guess. And like always, if you like the video, don't forget to actually like the video, subscribe to the channel and comment your thoughts as well. What do you think about the rental situation in Bengaluru? And do you think it will improve? Uh, let me know your thoughts. As always, I'll be reading and replying to most of the comments. And yeah, I'll probably see you next week. Until then, bye-bye.